Hey, this is Pastor Countryman here at Faith Vieira Lutheran Church, and uh, I'm excited to have you join us for a, a conversation between Dr. Fountain and me. And it is at least going to be two parts, but maybe more. And it is about... Um, well, it's, it's an important conversation, but not easy, as it's about suicide uh, and the things that would, would lead people to, to consider and act out on taking their own life. Uh, loneliness and isolation, and especially uh, this side of coming out of this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we talk about ways that we can, with Christ at the center, uh, meaningfully engage and care for one another within the body of Christ. And so thanks for joining us, and here's the first part of the conversation. All right, so uh, so we're gonna pick up. So this is our our first episode, right? And uh, we're talking about what well, you you had you were gonna write an article, and now we're doing a twenty first century multimedia thing. And I, who cannot type, find okay. this much easier. Yeah, maybe. it's maybe. just getting recorded. Yeah, well, yeah. either way, a good conversation. So, so. Tell me, tell us what what's behind this uh, this article we're doing. I'm going to set my timer here because I said we were going to I was going to time it. Twenty seven minutes. Well, I think in the first place, since I've been in ministry for now almost forty years, I've seen a lot of tragedy and. With the advent of COVID, I've seen the tragedies increase uh, dramatically. And the biggest things for me are the thoughts about suicide, suicidology, isolation, loneliness, bullying, and well-being for the children of the people that I come in contact with. Over the last 40 years, I've probably dealt with 50, 60 young people who were suicidal. And with the advent of COVID, we have some increases in some things that are the predictors hmm. of suicidal ideation such as the loneliness, the isolation, the, the mandate by the school board now that we will do our classes online. Mm. Um, and with that, we are increasing isolation. And as parents, we're thinking, well, our, our kids are working online to do their homework. Well, that may be true to a degree, but what are they doing with the other 20 hours that they're online? And that's the question. So, isolation, video games, we know that those things add to the, the possibility of suicide in the lives of kids. And I can't think of any um, any factor in life that's that's more devastating than the death of a child. And it's interesting that when you look at the demographics of people that die by their own hand, it's bimodal. So you have one group of kids, and I'm going to say from five or six years old, Mm. Uh, really till their early, maybe mid-twenties. And then the incidence of suicidal death drops way down, and it flattens out for a long time. And then when they hit 65 again, it goes back up. And from 65 to 85, or in reality, 65 the time you die, uh, the incidence of suicide is the highest of any any segment of the population. And so because of this and because of some things that uh, happened in my own family, which I'll get to in just a moment, 
um, it's made me really, really sensitive to when people are in trouble, when people are feeling anxiousness, when people are feeling depression, when f people feel helpless over their depression or their obsessiveness, it lifts the stakes for those who are suicidal. What happens is then they feel powerless, not over an addiction, but they feel powerless over their feelings. Mm. Uh, you have a, a husband and wife who live together for 60 years and all of a sudden one or the other dies and the surviving spouse is going, what do I do now? Yeah. You know, am I going to go out and date? Well, I haven't done that in 60 years. I wonder how that works today. And so now they're no longer a couple. No longer being a couple, they don't get invited to couple events. Uh, the people who were their friends kind of go by the wayside because now that couple's different. That lifts up um, the uh, depression to a point that it becomes counterproductive. And so what I'd like to do with this session is describe how it works with kids and we'll come back and do another session on how does it work with adults and it's similar and yet different. Well, could I, so a few things you said there and I appreciate that because I'm writing notes and now and you and I have had a couple conversations about this, but yeah. I think this is, uh, look, it's awful on the one hand. I mean, and, and so my experience has been as a pastor, as a Christian, that life is awful in the dual sense. Like, mm -hmm. Lord, have mercy. And yet there are those awe-filled moments, and they might be tiny, but they're more than enough and centered in, well, if Christ is risen, that, that's an awful thing. I mean, awe-filled. We wait for that great and glorious day when he returns that will be an awe-filled moment when all the sad things come untrue. But I want to, so one of the things you said, you talked about tragedy and about these tragedies, and I was, I was wondering, and then I think from what I remember from a literary definition, so a tragedy is a, a frown. Like, so it starts here, oh, there's a high point, and then um, Romeo and Juliet, it ends in two deaths. Yeah. It's a frown, and there's a suicide there. As opposed to, I think the definition is for Christians, life is a comedy by the literary definition, which is a smile, which is, I'm here, there's a really low point, and then it ends up on a high point, and then that's centered in, well, Christ is risen, and then, so there's a comedy, not that everything is a joke, but maybe there are things we take seriously, but not take ourselves too seriously. So that came to mind when you're talking, so when you talk about tragedy, Am I on the right track there? What do you? I, all kinds of things came to mind just when you talked about a tragedy. You see these tragedies. So the way I think about it is that smile of Christian hope and Christian faith, yeah. and everything is good. Right. Uh, Romans eight twenty eight. All things ah, yeah, work yeah, together yeah. for good for right. him who love God. But what happens when they don't? What happens when? I am a believing Christian and I'm going to church and I'm doing my dead level best to right. to model the faith and to live the faith but everything is going upside down you know my feelings are getting in the way of my emotional and right. physical well-being and if I can't control even my Emotions. What's the use? So okay. So I so I hear I hear what you're saying. So I so then I think, well, by definition, we are not perfectly rational, and, and also so we live in a time that says whatever I feel really strongly is what is true, whether it is or not, and you can't tell me. But so I feel it, and so then. Satan preys on that and knows that we're not rational and says, yeah, whatever your feelings are, it's that time. And especially if they're bad, it's that times a million, a, a, a infinite. Yeah. And so, so we're saying, though, feelings are a great... Th 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 it's not that feelings don't have a place, 
But at the end of the day, whether you feel as though you were loved or not is not what is the proof of God's love for you. Right. It's what He has said and what's true. So, I, so I want to. But there is one whose feelings always reflect reality, and you know the answer, Jesus. Of course. So He weeps when Laz, He rightly weeps when Lazarus is dead. Jesus gets angry, and He turns over the tables in the temple. But, right. but our my feelings are not always an accurate reflection of reality because I am tend to get really exercised about frankly stupid things. Just ask my wife and kids. Or my parents. Uh, I don't want to. And do sometimes that. I don't have any feelings about things that maybe I should give a rip about. Yeah. So feelings do have a place, but they're not always right. And that's part of what we're trying to tie into here, and, also. And that's what Luther called schwammerei. Oh, the enthusiasts. The, the enthusiasts. Yeah. That yeah. are so focused on their feelings right. that they forget about the cognitive truths of Christ on a cross. Oh, so it's a both and. Yeah. Faith and hope. It's faith. Head and heart. It is head and heart oh, okay. together. And so what happens sometimes is with this, the problem today is because now the kids are in the home, they're spending way too much time on, on their um, computers. Yeah. We don't know what they're doing on computers. And, and that's a problem from a two or three different angles okay um, one being the isolation two being the violence of the mm. video games that okay. they watch third a lot of these are high school age kids they're very susceptible then to pornography they're susceptible susceptible to chat rooms uh, they put themselves at risk uh, for sexual predators mm. to be out there. All of these things now are, are built into it. So let me tell you a story. It's true, it's about my own family that maybe will sum this up a little better. Yeah. So a number of years ago, before COVID, uh, my granddaughter went to a Christian school, very well known, very big Christian school, South Florida. And she was active in all kinds of things, Cheer, cheerleading, hockey, field hockey, um, soccer, that she calls football. It's not. <laughs> um, and everything was fine. And then COVID came. And COVID was affecting everybody. When that came, as I said a little while ago, all of a sudden school's online. Everybody is isolating. Yeah. The teachers are using that now as a, as a way to teach. In the middle of that, about two years ago, my granddaughter was exposed to COVID, but did not have COVID. She had, a, had something called MISC, which is multi-system inflammation syndrome which means that the virus from the COVID got inside her bodily systems and affected her heart, mm. affected her mind, affected her kidneys. And still two years later, she's still under a doctor's care for all those things. Yeah. So she's in the hospital for two or three weeks and the doctors are trying to figure out how to, how to treat her. So they give her massive amounts of steroids they give her all kinds of antiviral medication. They give her uh, antibiotics, everything to try to get the inflammation under control. Because of that, she started putting on weight, which what ha is what happens when you're taking Medrol, Solimedrol, which she was taking. Um, she started losing her hair she looked like uh, somebody who'd been on chemotherapy. So they get her somewhat healed and over this and clean of the, uh, clear of the infection. She goes back to school. She looks very different than the girl who left. She's now gained a lot of weight, so she's heavier. Her hair was down to her waist, and now it's to her ears and shaggy and, and strange looking. And so what happens is the kids start 
uh, criticizing her about her looks, about her weight gain, about all these different things. She's not allowed to compete in any kind of organized sport because the doctors are afraid of the damage to her heart. So then it went from criticism about the way she looks, the way she dresses, all this stuff, to now bullying, uh, being an astute young lady. She took the bullying reports to the principal of the school. They ignored it, so they did nothing. It got so that my granddaughter did not want to return to the school where she had gone for seven years. It got to the point where she was talking in suicidal language. You know, if this is what my life's uh, like, I don't want to live it anymore. Um, so things escalated for her. She's isolated. She was alone. She uh, was online and she would talk to her friends online because that's what kids do. But they would be tormenting her online mm. about all these things. And it got worse and worse and worse. She finally quit school, went back and, and did it online where it's safer. Uh, and then, then after Christmas that year, went to another school and that's been better. But the point is, is that when a child is brutalized through bullying, through teasing, through any of those kinds of things, uh, you become normless. You don't want to be around any of those kids. You know, if you love me, I don't believe you would hurt me. Yeah. So the trust relationship, like the trust we have with Jesus, uh, is never ending. You know, he's always there. He's always rescuing us. But a teenager struggling with those concepts doesn't really get it. The longer they stay in the room, the longer they isolate, the longer they stay away from friends, uh, the longer the diseases go on, the more at risk they are. I have another granddaughter who's on the spectrum uh, for autism, uh, low end of the spectrum. Uh, but she, too, was bullied in school. She's a lot younger. Uh, she was in first and second grade and, and bullied because she thinks differently than other kids think. Yeah, because she is different. Uh, she's very creative, but they don't really want that too much. Yeah. Um, and so she, too, at first and second grade is talking about why why should I want to live like this and I said because God created you God loves you God cares for you but I don't feel good and so then I find out that she's on TikTok all the time she's on iPad on uh, whatever that other thing is uh, Instagram no the um, Facebook mm. all the time uh, so she's doing things that aren't giving her positive affirmation. Everything that she's doing has negative connection. So if we have a child who's been traumatized in by car accidents, by war, by loss of a parent, loss of a sibling, uh, traumatized by uh, the things they see on the news or in video games, uh, traumatized by uh, any of that, we know that the likelihood of suicide increases exponentially. Uh, so we know if the child has weight issues, self-esteem issues, the child is different in any way, that child's going to be picked on and bullied. Now when I was a kid, when we picked on a kid, we just went and beat him up. But now it's it's the physical violence isn't there, it's emotional violence. The, the words though, so this, the sticks and stones may break my bones, but the, the words hurt even more. And, and really as humans, 
the words are so important. The word, the one who is the word is central because what, what came to mind when you were talking about, you talked about being powerless and not having strength and then, and then going into despair, which is the absence of hope. And so then I'm thinking through that oh, identity, which is important at every stage of life, but certainly uh, for certainly. children into adolescent years, teen years. So this question of who am I, and if I am being reinforced with the idea of hearing all these awful, hearing and seeing these awful things, and then Satan who hates the things that God loves, I mean, and the old Adam would collude in some sense, our sinful nature, he says, yeah, you're nothing, you're useless. And then, and then Satan just whispers, there's a way out of this, which is a lie. You just end it. Satan hates the things that God loves. And so so then it's this being separated. And you said, yeah, so it takes faith to believe that all things work together, Romans 8, 28. But if we, Romans 8, 26 is uh, we don't know what to pray for as we ought, but the Holy Spirit intercedes with groanings even too deep for words. And I always wonder, is the Holy Spirit groaning for me or hearing my groans? Both. In your case, the groans, uh, uh, the groans of a of a grandfather, a father who hurts, the groans of the body of Christ in general. But then I also, so you, you, you talked about, yeah, you're not alone. And it's in Romans 8, though, that builds to this crescendo that nothing will separate us. Right. Yet it takes faith to believe. Because right now it feels terrible. I feel like this multi-system inflammatory, whatever you... Syndrome. Syndrome. So it is a holistic thing, and, and yet it just feels like, yeah, that this is really going to separate. And so we need to be reminded we actually are dependent on God always, specifically on Christ Jesus, but we're also dependent on one another. But from what you're describing then, in some sense, insidiously, it's those on whom I should be able to depend that now it seems like are inflicting harm. Or my body itself, like I have to depend on my body. My body and soul are really together. They don't seem to be working together, and I can't even depend on my own body. It's inflamed. Yeah. There's a lot going on there. Lord, have mercy. <laughs> Absolutely. And so, you know, you have a 15-year-old girl who uh, is devastated by life. What do you do? Well, is this life? And Satan would say, yeah, it's not life. Yeah, it's and not yet life. to say the one who is life is Jesus, and yet, so like, well, that's the last place. And so then we have to encourage one another. You can't do, go it alone. But it, all, but it goes back to this, oh, I feel so alone. And to just say, well, you need to be more active in church as an answer. Uh, essentially, that's true. Well, I'm all for simplicity, but not overly simplistic <laughs> things. That's right. Well, all you got to do. <laughs> yeah. Well, easy to say. And it doesn't work like that. Yeah, so simple doesn't mean easy. Does Simple does not mean easy. Because uh, nothing about it is simple. Faith isn't simple. It's complex. Oh, it's a paradox. It's very simple paradox. and complex at the yeah. same time. Yeah. It's all about Jesus and yet multifaceted. And so uh, what we do is we see all these kids, not only the COVID kids, but the kids who are entrenched in watching their video games. I don't know, have you, have you ever watched any of your kids on any of the video games and stuff? I, I mean, sometimes I would play games with them, but not really anymore. Well, what often happens is that if you watch them, watch their eye movements, and you'll see that they're totally engrossed in what they're doing, which is similar, not the same, but similar to a psychological trance. Okay. A hypnotic trance. Oh. So what that does is when someone is in a trance state, it opens up their mind okay. to influence. Hmm. So now what these kids are watching is maybe violence. And they're in a trance state. All that stuff is going in, and that's changing them behaviorally. Hmm. They see this person getting shot getting right up and doing it again, well, that must not be very important. Or they're watching porn, you know, and they're wondering about their own sexuality. They're, they're worried about masturbation and all of the things that go along with the sexual, uh, the sexual revolution, if you will. I know that's an old term, but 
now that the kids are have, have that access to the porn, access to chat rooms, it makes it places them in a position of great vulnerability. Well, aren't we always? But but, but you said the sexual revolution is old. We we, we are we're st- everything old is new. Everything new is old. We we are reaping the negative fruit of I, I mean the 1960s at the very least which there's no such thing as free love or whatever is that is that a you know so well you're too young for that well uh, i'm an old soul maybe but but <laughs> uh but but we have absolute confusion and chaos now you talk about a sexual revolution what is a man what is a woman what 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 is a human uh, because we live in an era not just of uh, transsexual, but transhumanism, which says, you know, why we, why be confined by your body? Why not get an implant and, and get a neural network? And in, I mean, why? Why? So, but, but Satan hates the things that God loves, and so so I, I thought Adam and Eve were the pinnacle of God's creation, and Satan comes and says, yeah, he, he lies. He says, well, you could be more than that, which actually makes us subhuman. And then he lies and says, you know, the way that maybe you could be truly a human is just to end your life. And that's a lie. You, 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 and if God loves you, he'll take you to heaven anyway. Another lie. Or, or that you say, God doesn't love you, but I love you more. And he's a, t- I mean, Satan is, it, it can create nothing new. He's the worst kind of father. But the way to know that God the Father is your Father is through faith, which in some sense, though, is to die and be born again. Not in some sense, I guess in a literal sense. To, to die and be born again, but where does that happen? Not at your own hand. We would say in the church, well, in the, in the font, you're drowned and raised to new life. But then every day, how about I wake up and I do stupid stuff again, or I don't believe it. Well, return to who and whose you are. So we don't out, ever outgrow being a child of God either. You sound like a Lutheran. Well, I'm trying to be. I'm trying to be a Christian. Luther says that each day, yeah, a man is drowned and dies, and a new man comes forth. Yeah, and we do that as we think about our our baptism in Christ Jesus. I mean, that's powerful stuff. So, what's the answer? Jesus. It is Jesus. It is Jesus. But how do I get the kids yeah. there? And I think the. One of the things we do as, as church is make sure that the congregation, the church, and everybody is organized around caring for the flock. Yeah. And I'm talking about right now the, the young flock and giving them ways to talk, to act, and maybe using this, this website will be very helpful for the kids to engage and begin to think about what is my life doing? Where is it going? How am I? How am I acting? So, as parents, I've got five kind of rules that I think that parents should follow to help stop some. I'm going to write this. these down. Okay. You're going to give them to us now. I am. Okay. So the first thing I would tell any parent today of any child. Okay. And I've seen. Two-year-olds and three-year-olds on iPads. Yeah, I mean, we, I, I thought it was a good idea 13 years ago, and I'm not so sure now. With yeah. letting my kid, and then our one of our kids was just about obsessed. I'm not, I wouldn't say just about. It was an addiction. So the first thing is remove the computer from the bedroom. When you say computer, you mean electronic devices? What, yes. what do you? Yeah. Okay. Computer, iPads, iPhones, any of those things. What about a, uh, a Amazon Echo Show, whatever thing? Yeah, like another thing. Yeah. So, so you're are you saying go cold turkey? No electronic devices. No. Nope. No weaning period. Well, that's what I'm going to tell you now. Okay. Point number two. Okay. That a child should have no more than one hour a day of playtime on computer electronic devices. The reason for that is the teachers are already giving them homework that they have to do on the computer. Yeah. So they may be on the computer two or three hours a day, mm. and now not only have to do that, but then they get their playtime 
on top of that, so now there's, it's four hours a day, right. three hours a day, and multiply that out, and it's a huge block of time. Right. So one hour a day. Okay. Um, the third thing is I would encourage all families to eat dinner together. So what happens is, you know, in a lot of families today, the the parents are eating on TV trays or sitting on the couch. The kids are taking their their meals in their bedroom. I thought they just stopped at Chick Fil A on the way home, and one person eats here, or one person stands, or eating shifts. Exactly. Do you even need to eat? Yeah, it's yeah. just chaotic. But what we've lost is the family fellowship. Mm. Some would call, and you've I know you've heard this term, the family altar where we get together, we talk about our day, we pray for each other, uh, we do Bible studies uh, together as a family, we integrate with the family because the closer the family is bound together, the less likely they will be to commit suicide, less likely they'll be to scroll, to, to swerve away from the church. Um, so that's a healthy dependency. It's a healthy because you had alluded to we don't we want to eliminate the unhealthy dependencies, right? And lean into the healthy dependencies. God created the family for a reason. Yeah, that's where we get our supports, where we get our self esteem. Uh, it's how we control the early part of our life. Um, four. Get the kids in some kind of ex extracurricular activity. Okay. I don't care what it is, but get them involved and keep them involved and don't let them whine and all of those things and say, I don't want to play tennis anymore. I don't want to swim anymore. I don't want to be in gymnastics or whatever it happens to be. But keep them uh, connected with their peers. That's terribly important. So you're, but, but it sounds like this is a connection that's that's a physical, it's a healthy physical connection. You, you're talking about sports or a choir or a musical thing, but couldn't they be connected by playing online games uh, until three in the morning? You, I mean, well, we, that's what they would say. But you, but you're saying that you, because there's a there's a thread here though, from electronic devices which have like a virtual reality but not reality one hour per day, per day on those devices, eat dinner as a family, but don't everybody sit with your phone out glued into this and maybe look around, but put your device away. And now some kind of incarnate, incarnational embodied positive thing. Yeah, extra to, extra to the family. Okay. So you're going out and meeting with Kids maybe you don't know, or you're playing football or volleyball or basketball or whatever it may okay. be. Uh, well, you know about basketball. Yeah, but that's uh, that's an Purdue, Indiana yeah. kind sure. of yeah. thing. Just don't mention Purdue basketball to me right now. Oh, well, yeah, well, they lost. Whatever year this is done, it'll still be the same tragic story. So, so, so fifth point. Worship together. Pray together. Bible study together demonstrate to the kids that this process is absolutely crucial to their emotional and physical development. What a lot of churches have done, and we haven't, and we won't, uh, well... I've, when you say church, you mean this local congregation, church body, what do you mean? Um, different church bodies, okay. the non-denominationals and some of the others, where they've e even sat, set up uh, uh, video games and things in the narthex of the church and allow the kids to go and play on them during church services. Yeah, I, 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 that's probably that's, uh, yeah, it's pretty counter productive. You're going to play games? Well, yeah, anyway. Yeah. I I'm mean, going to pass on that one. I, you had me up to the point of during the church service. Yeah, but that's that's hard. You know, they, they need to worship. They need to hear the Word. The Word works. You know, the sacraments mm -hmm. work. And so we need to, to facilitate 
that process of congregate worship. We need to facilitate the process of this is what families do who stay together. This is what families do who don't struggle with substance abuse, don't struggle with divorce, don't struggle with incest uh, or other trauma-related issues. And lastly, if a parent sees signs of depression, anxiety, trauma, trauma history, what they've seen, what they've gone through, bullying, broken relationships, they need to see a mental health counselor of one variety or another. The issue at stake is the life of the child. I was in high school and I played trumpet in the band and one day the guy that sat a couple seats down from me went home at lunch blew his brains out. Mm. Uh, have mercy. You know, what happened? What went wrong? And this is before the devices. I mean, not that you're that old. <laughs> I'm old enough. Um, no, that's right. But he was a trauma victim. He watched his father shoot his mother mm. with a gun and then turn the gun on himself and kill himself. So that was his trauma history, which lay dormant and he never thought about until he had issues in school. Yeah. And where do you turn? Well, I'll do what daddy did. I'll commit suicide. So that's what happens in kind of the broad perspective of of uh, children, teenagers, younger adults that find no way out of their situation other than suicide, drugs, alcohol, uh, promiscuous sex, all of the things that uh, that calm down our pleasure center in the brain. They're all connected together. And so we need to find other ways. So my solution is that Jesus Christ be the absolute center of our lives. It's no longer enough to come and worship on Sunday forget about it all on Monday until the next Sunday and do nothing in between. And what I'm suggesting is that in terms of church, in terms of, of, of the congregation, of walking together, the Concordia kind of thing, right. that we walk in Jesus continually. There's an old hymn in the hymnal. It was actually Robert Preuss's favorite hymn. Uh, I walk in danger all the way, yeah. though troubles may assail me. And, and it goes on and on about all the different things that happen in life. Yeah. And so we do walk in danger, but we need to walk co with a constant reminder that Jesus is in control. He's in charge. He says, he promised, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will be with you until the end of the age. Even through these difficult times called COVID, called MISC or MISA, which is the adult version of the same disease, um, it doesn't matter what it is. I'll be here. And I'm bigger than your bullying. I'm bigger than your problems. I'm bigger, I'm bigger than drug addiction or food addiction or whatever it may happen to be. I'm bigger than all of that. And I will take you by the hand and I will lead you day by day, inch by inch, as we tread toward our eternal life. And that's the point I want to get to parents 
so that they A, will recognize the dangers, B, doing something preventive, even though the kids, like maybe your kids would say, one hour a day on the computer? No, you have three hours to do your homework. So that's four hours a day on the computer. What are you complaining about? It's half your work day. Uh, I know that's, I'm being a little facetious, but the point is, is that this is self-protection. You would no more let your child go swim in the pond out back of your house. Well, not here in Florida, maybe in the Midwest. They have alligators out there? No. Uh, okay. Well, here they're liable to get eaten. Well, right. And so you wouldn't let them do that. Well, it's all, I mean, and you wouldn't want them to ingest or think. So, so these things that we're putting into our body and these things that are coming in through the eye, right, the lamp. Uh, so so I, I guess just to, to tie this up for today then, because so what's been helpful for me, and I think you, you and I talked to it earlier, like, so we're having... We, we want to have real conversations. This is not, well, when you get your life together and you're a nice person, then you ought to think about church or Jesus. We're saying this is the place. There is nothing more real than this place. And we're going to go into some dark things. And so part of this was let's, let's forget about some of the assumptions that we have that are false. Uh, mental illness, feeling isolated, the reality of isolation is not just limited to one segment in life. It's it's all, it's it's there. And, and you would say, not only are we talking about adolescence, you want to go dark, it's, it may be even more pervasive between people people in the winter of their life, but nobody's immune to it. But also then, I would say there is nothing more real, if we, if we live like we believe it's true, than what happens in Christ, in baptism, in, in the divine service, in, in the, the sacrament of the altar. There's nothing more real than that. And so all of life is seen in that. And so we're also being real about, let's just be honest about the dark side of some of these things. And, and then have the courage to have the conversations with, as, as parent to child, as a child of God to a Heavenly Father. Look, sometimes look, the answer is, I, don't, I just say, Lord, I don't know. Have mercy. Um, and, and, and into that, then we're saying, have the courage, even, even if you don't know how to perfectly have the conversation, try. And, and, and then, as the church, we're not just going through the motions. We're, we're, having, we're, we're trying to get into this because these are our hearts should be broken about certain things. Yeah. We shouldn't be indifferent. But also to say, we also don't have to limp through life completely, well, I wish we had something good enough. But there, no, this is, there's nothing better than what's in Christ, and we're working through how do we share that and lean into that and trust one another. And that's what the Unisancta is all about, mm. the Holy you're, Christian you're into that Church. Latin. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I'll, I'll quit. I'll quit. <laughs> but the yeah. Holy Christian Church yeah. on earth, yeah. you know, there's We're, one church. There's one church. And one we, body. And we worship in that church. Uh, what was that John 6 about the, the body and the high priestly prayer and all of those things? I think it's John 17. 17, whatever. John 6 is bread of life. Uh, it's all Jesus. That's right. But that they may be one because you know what? Because Satan wants to separate. And sin separates. Christ unites. Exactly. And we need to remember that. Not only remember it, but act on it. Yeah. Um, wise man once said to me, you can tell what a church believes by looking at their budget. Hmm. And I thought about that as a pastor for a good many years. Is there a budget here at Faith Vier Lutheran Church? Nah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm hoping so. Some kind of budget. It takes money, okay. But, but what happens is if you see a church that has a mission line and it's one percent or less of the total budget, right. you got a problem. Right. I mean, that church isn't acting out the Great Commission. And it's know, a scarcity mindset. Well, I don't know. Just Yeah, I little. don't want to spend money because I might need it down the road. Brothers and sisters, you've got to understand that what we're dealing with is is not only life and death, but we're we're talking about eternal security, where you're going to live out your life, uh, on in into eternity. Silicon Valley Bank, anyway. All the banks are collapsing. Everything. I don't. Crypto is not the answer. 
Money is a great tool, a terrible master. And as St. Bob Dylan says, you got to serve somebody. St. Bob Dylan, huh? He's a great guy. Right, hey, but you know what I appreciate about our, our budget here is I understand it, that you are part of the body of Christ here. And and one of the priorities, and so not only we're using the technology here, but but the fact that, that you are here and, and God using you, not only do you have to be a member, whatever a mem member is, to have a conversation with the Reverend Dr. Doug Fountain here at Faith Vier, or is this open no. to anybody coming to talk open to Open to anybody. Okay. If you have a need, this is where to bring it. Okay. And, uh, you know, we Christian counseling is n not very well found in the community. I mean, to find a Christian counselor is very different and very difficult. Um, but here, because I'm a pastor, because I have a doctorate in, in counseling, uh, we can get help, but then support that help through congregational life. Yeah. Yeah, because the ultimate goal is to connect them with Jesus. Yeah. And the disconnect is terrible. But we come together, and I'm, I'm going to talk more about this next week when we... We've blown right through our timeline, but that's fine. It's our first time doing this. This is the best one we've ever done. <laughs> and the worst. <laughs> oh, well, you had to say it. No, yeah. <laughs> so next time, we're, we're going to go... Where, where are we going to go next time? So next time, what we're going to do is we've talked about the group of people who are teenage, pre-teenage okay. kids, young adults. What we're going to do now is look at that other group of people who are 65 and older. Okay. And how do we interact with them in such a way to help them feel connection? So that, for instance, you have a, a man and his wife married 60 years and all of a sudden one of the partners dies. Yeah. What do you do with that depression? And there's going to be depression. Well, I would hope there would be some grieving. Well, there's going to be grieving. There's going to be an adjustment problem. There's an identity. Is, yep. I mean, everything. They no longer, because now they're not a couple, they no longer get invited to things that are couples' things. Right. You know, because now they're a single. Well, and the two so they feel more thing. isolated yeah. and more alone. Yeah. Um, and that adjustment period is really, really difficult for a lot of people. Yeah. Even people who have a wonderful, firm relationship with Jesus Christ, yeah. they still, their, their well-being is disrupted. So what we're going to talk about next week is uh, what goes on with that older age group. Yeah. How do we address it? What are the things to look out for? Uh, and how do we move them <clears throat> to a higher level in terms of their spirituality, their trust, their hope, their faith, their love for the Lord Jesus? All right. So it's it's heady stuff. I mean, it's this is not counseling at the lowest common denominator. This is life at the highest possible level. Yeah. And that's important. Well, I, I look forward to it. And uh, so as we walk in danger all the way, we don't walk alone. Right. The body of Christ is here. Uh, and Christ, our Lord, is here as well. So thank you for your time. Yeah, absolutely. And, well, uh, we'll get together. How would we wrap this up? If there's some kind of music? It would be like a hymn or something. Or a Bob Dylan song? I don't know. Uh, I don't know any Bob Dylan songs. Blood on the Tracks? Leopard skin pillbox hat. Uh, no. No. How about uh, I'll fly away. Okay. That's <laughs> so. Let's pray. Almighty God, merciful Father, we realize that the world in which we live in is tragic in many ways. That since Satan was allowed to come into the world and and convince us that um, that the law saves rather than the gospel. Since he has come in, he's destroyed the way in which we do life. 
And Father, as we have moved through the centuries and the millennium, and now we're dealing with a new set of issues and, and different responses, Lord, educate our minds and our hearts to the gravity of the situation around us. Help, help us, Lord, to reach out to the children as Jesus always cared for the children. Help us likewise to show them as a priority for us. Father, we ask you to continue to bless those in our care. Help the pastors here, the vicars, the teachers, all to glorify your holy name and all we say and do. Lord, be with our people and the people of the world. Help them to see the light of the gospel, for that gospel gives us life, light, and immortality. Father, we thank you for your grace and love. In Jesus' wonderful and precious name we pray. Amen. Amen.